Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar with um, Auto Entry by Sage. We are talking about all sorts of things today to ease the cost recruitment and the capacity crisis in your firm. Delighted to have with us um, Keir Thomas Bryant and Will Spence from um, Auto Entry. Guys, introduce yourself and tell us what we're going to be talking about today. Hi. Yeah, firstly, just let me thank you, 2020 Innovation, for the opportunity to speak. So I'm really looking forward to hosting the webinar. And yeah, so just a bit of an introduction about me. So my name's Will. So I'm one of the product specialists from Auto Entry. And I've been working with accountants and bookkeepers for a long time. Feels like forever. It was probably just about 10 years, to be honest. And a big focus around technology. And today, just all about app stacks, efficiencies, and much, much more. Kia, okay, you introduce yourself. Okay, thank you, Will. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Kia. I work as the content manager at Auto Entry, and uh, that's my my job. Uh, I've been working at Sage now for seven years, where I've been creating lots of content about um, how to help accountants, um, everything from compliance all the way through to managing a practice successfully. Prior to that, I used to work as um, a textbook, computer textbook author, and then prior to that, I worked as an IT journalist. And in fact, I edited magazine, computer magazines for five years. So it's basically been my job for the last um, couple of decades to look at technology and look at where it's breaking through into becoming useful for mere mortals like us. And in fact, I'll be stepping in later in the presentation to discuss chat GPT and provide a bit of a crash course in how to use it, how accountants get the most out of it and what it's all about for accountants. Uh, but I'll hand back to Will, who will be taking you through the next few slides. Actually, you're going to hand back to me because I um, just want to do a bit of admin before we start, if that's okay, Kit. Um, yes, we'll so be sorry. here for about 40 minutes to an hour, and um, we've obviously muted the sound at your end, guys. So if you have questions for Will or Kia on anything that they're talking about today, uh, please use the question um, and answer pad on your control panel that says questions and I'll be here to monitor them every so often and interrupt Will rudely and Keir rudely and your questions um, while they are going through their presentation. Um, there'll be a slight, there'll be a poll at the end of today's session and um, so stay on for that. It really is exciting so um, Will take us through what the agenda is today. Oh, thanks a lot Ian. So yeah today we're going to cover quite a lot um, and we're going to start off about being AppStack ready and all up to date ready for 2024. So leaving 2023 behind and really being optimised for the new year. We're going to touch and talk about cost per client and how to keep these under control. Look at efficiency within apps and thinking about apps as a software as an employee. And I'm sure you've all heard of ChatGPT and we've got Kier who's going to jump in and do a live crash course around ChatGPT, really showing you what it can do, and then finish around a practice plan for success as well. And next slide, please, Kia. So let's just start with a bit of a refresher. So all around creating a fully featured app stack. So what are the benefits of building and integrating apps? You know, there's a few things that you should be looking at. And first one being, you know, connectivity with clients. This, this means about moving data instantly and seamlessly between yourself and your clients. And I bet you've all got many, many examples out there. But the one that kind of sticks in my mind is around COVID. And it was around funding applications and getting government assistance for clients. You know, thinking about cloud and getting that data, the reports, that cloud aspect made it just super easy. You know, if cloud wasn't a resource, you know, it would have been emailing data, it would have been having printed copies even. You know, nextly, it's introduce efficiencies into your core processes. You know, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, it's not about introducing technology for technology's sake. It's the importance of introducing apps that will add benefit to you and also your clients. You know, taking away those manual tasks that I would say most of us will hate doing. And even from a recruitment point of view, you know, thinking about those junior employees, you know, they're the ones that would probably be getting those manual tasks. So taking away that, giving those junior employees a little bit more to do, being that more productive, more useful, and more valued. 
you know, especially beneficial in the, the current hiring crisis in the industry. And freeing up time so you can use your experience to work on better things. So I mentioned just now about manual tasks. So that's like everything from putting in your receipts to chasing late payments. You know, let's say that you've freed up that time so that you can look into more advisory roles with your clients instead. You know, one, this will radically change your service offerings for your clients. You'll get closer to your clients. You'll be better used to your clients. And then that usefulness will then turn into an increase in fees as well. So all without the client being concerned about the fees that they're paying. You know, if, if your aim is to grow and you want to free up some time, it might just be for training, it might be for a better work-life balance, then app stacks can really help you massively with those sort of goals. And the last one that we've got on this window is collateral benefits. So you present as that digital first. You know, this is just vital if you think about new generations that are starting businesses right now. You know, something I heard quite recently, which kind of shocked me as well, is that, you know, the oldest member of the Gen Z gen generation is 26 years old. The oldest generation, millennial generation, is 42 years old. You know, it's, it's this sort of generation that's been brought up on technology. And these are the ones that are starting businesses. And it's about meeting their expectations and being digital first as well. And next slide, please, Kia. So at this point, I just want to show you and introduce a little bit of a cheat sheet. And what this has shown is just client touch points. So it provides a bit of a clue on where applying apps can have maximum benefit and efficiency. So on this window, we've got six listed out, and that's going from that new client acquisition through to the one at the end for client payments. You know, thinking about your own processes, you know, you might have more touch points, you might have less touch points. All we've done here, just list out a few is that kind of good starting point. You know, and it's at the end, it's no secret, you know, app makers, they do think of along the same lines. You know, they think about what apps can be developed to add benefit and efficiencies in, in different parts. In a moment, I am going to jump through each of these different sections and just give you some apps that can target these areas as well. But I think what really becomes clear is when you start looking into this further, you know, your, your cost per client, they do fall within two key areas, and that's going to be your labor area and your software that you use. You know, apps, they can massively reduce labor. But if you don't use apps or the lack of apps, that can massively increase labor costs. And thinking about these areas, a lot of these or most of these can be automated in some degree. So things like receiving client payments, for example, there's payment providers out there where you can set up direct debits at a, a very small cost or reporting and forecasting. You've got tools like Futurely that can help you project over three years. If I can move on, please, Kia. So going back to that first point in the timeline that we've just seen. So that first one was all about that new client acquisition. So the components of your app stack, it's not all to do with managing the numbers. No, you can add in things like marketing tools as well. And that's going to assist with new client acquisition. It's going to encourage existing clients to stick with you. And it's even going to encourage upselling opportunities as well. Essentially. You're looking for anything that can introduce efficiencies and again reduce that time taken so with marketing tools you know this is especially useful because these tools they help with areas that might not be a normal area of expertise you know such as creating that online presence and social media you no know, it's it's easy it's cheap and often it's going to be that free way to market to your client target base you know it's it's going to encourage you see that those existing clients, it's going to socially, it's going to allow you to communicate with those existing clients as well without leaving the house. And I know if you're anything like me, I'm opening up my apps all the time on social media, don't know, 20, 30, 40 times a day. So why not extend your business into that area as well? So if you haven't already considered, you know, things like a business Facebook page, a LinkedIn company page, 
or a Twitter handle or X as it's now called, but something built around social media specifically for your business. And then you've got apps like Hootsuite and Social B. You know, they're really good so that you can spend a little bit of time at the start of the week, say 15, 20 minutes to then schedule posts that'll go out on social media. And something really to remember is that social media platforms, they do reward people who drive engagement by frequent posts. So the more that you post, the more likely that you're going to get noticed as well. And next slide, please, Kia. So the, the second touch point was all around that client engagement in AML. And that's going to be anything from issuing a contract to AML compliance, um, even chasing for all this to be completed as well. And you know, th there's a perfect solution out there that can help you with all that. So this is the first app that I'm going to talk about, which is from Sage. And I know Sage has been putting a lot of work in recently around that whole platform of apps for accountants and bookkeepers. So that proposal to advisory. And there's apps like Go Proposal and Oversuite. You know, lots of different elements to it. So it's for pricing consistently by having that structured pricing matrix for your clients. You know, avoid that scope creep and really just charge what you're worth. And I would guess a lot of you come across where you're doing a lot more but not charging for it. So having that app that's going to automate and make that, that process consistent. You know, as well as having professional proposal letters, you know, minimize risk with audit, automated engagement letters using what's called Oversuite. And then you've got AML compliant in there as well. And that's from your, your KYC, you know your client, your risk assessments and your ID checks as well built in. And it's, it's that end-to-end -end app about creating complex documents and completing complex tasks, but doing that efficiently and more importantly, in real time as well. And all of which, it's, it's all that open ecosystem. So you'll hear me mention that quite a bit today, but it, it all integrates seamlessly with all of their top account software as well. And the next slide, please. So the, the third touch point is all around your clients. So it's, it's getting that data and getting the documents from clients. So another Sage app, but this time from the side of the company that I work for, so Auto Entry. You know, Auto Entry, it, it is packed with loads of different features, but it, it is really good, amazing value as well. And I did see a review quite recently from a website called Captira, and the quote from that website was that the price cannot be beat, you know, provides a whole lot of value for the cost. Don't get me wrong, there, there are other automation apps out there for data entry, you know, but to quote that same um, same review, the, the actual quote was, I'm not going to say the competitor's name, but insert competitor's name here, you know, that the pricing model is no longer affordable to me. You know, auto entry, it isn't just invoices and, rece and receipts that will extract, you know, there's a lot more by automatically extracting supplier statements to help with reconciliation, You've got bank statements and expenses, and it's as simple as you know, scan it in, you know, take a photo on your phone as well to upload, and then it's about categorization. It can then publish into your accounting software. You could even get Excel documents out if you want to have a little look further and kind of drill into the detail in Excel instead, or even like I mentioned, cross-reference supplier statements, all of which being able to set up things like rules to automate processes in the future. And again, just like yeah, the Go proposal that I've mentioned app, it's that open ecosystem that integrates as well with accounting systems. And the next slide, which we're pretty much staying on the, the getting the data side of it. So you've got mileage apps. You know, this one's for your clients. You know, it could be for yourself. It's going to be anyone that's really going to be on site. And most of us, you know, will already use apps when we're driving. So I know my personal favorite. So I use Waze for navigation, kind of can't beat it. I love it. But you've got apps like Google Maps as well. You do also have apps like Mileage IQ and Triplog. You know, what these are going to do, it's going to allow you to automate the mileage login in a HMRC compatible way. You know, they calculate out the costs 
they send the data straight to your accounting software. And one, it's no more scribbling down the mileage logs. And two, no more requirement to key that data in to your accounting software. So effectively removing that duplication as well. And you know, apps they're a lot more accurate and precise than any humans like likely to be. You know, those little fractions of a mile, you know, if, if I'm going to tend to round down, round up, you know, they really do make a difference over the year and they can add up as well. And the next slide, please, Kia. So that fourth touch point that we saw in the timeline was client servicing. You know, client servicing will obviously be done with your or your, your client's accounting app of choice. But client or practice management software or a CRM, a client relationship management app, you know, that can be an absolute game changer if you're not using it already. You know, it allows you to keep all of your data for your client all in one place. You know, those important deadlines like compliance information, you know, year ends, you know, registration details are all at your fingertips. And you can even log communications, you know, really build a picture of what's going on with your clients. And you can also record in, you know, the work that's been done by your team. You know, all vendors that do have tools that will help you with this. You know, the one that I talk about and the one that I'm involved with is a one called Sage for Accountants. You know, it's free for basic use, but it also offers the integrations of auto entry and go proposal apps that I've mentioned already. And the next slide, please, Kia. So I can't really stress enough the benefits around integrations, you know, live data and always having that real time information all up to date. You know, reporting and forecasting. I can imagine everyone thinking the same thing. It's it's got massive advantages in this area. And again, you know, a little bit of a, an apology for featuring another Sage app, but it is something that Sage is doing quite well right now with. And of course, you know, the integrations that I mentioned today, it's not just obviously for the Sage ecosystem, it's a, an ecosystem that does branch out as well. But with your reporting and forecasting, you know, there's apps like Futurely, you know, powerful reporting and analysis. You've got things like profits, trends, you can do predictions over three years across your profit and loss. You can even look at daily business analysis, so looking at customer supplier analysis. You can create different packs, so board packs, funding applications, and really giving you that live data so you can review that cash flow. You know, we mentioned advisories a little bit earlier, so allowing you to give that better advice to your clients on things like, you know, when do I pay a supplier? You know, is there going to be any impact of this payment as well? And next slide, please, Kia. And that last touch point, you know, receiving client payments, you know, getting fees off your clients. You know, we all know that it's a bit of a pain. So if you if you don't take care of it, then your cash flow suffers. But if you spend too much time chasing payments, then your work suffers. And as you'll all know, that, that can take a lot, a lot of time chasing these payments. You know, automation is a word I say all the time, but it, it is key. And Automation isn't just receiving payments, it's all the different touch points that we've mentioned and more that you might have in your day-to-day, your, -day, your week-to-week -week work that you, you're going through. And the first one I want to mention around receiving payments is a direct debit service like Go Cardless. So probably the, the key point around Go Cardless is it offers direct debits without you needing to go through your bank. I don't know if many people have tried doing it unless you're a large business, you know, it is really difficult to really set up that sort of payment scheme. But Go Cardless, you know, it, it makes it accessible direct debits to everyone. And you can even use it for one-off payments as well. You know, there are other ones out there as well. So you've got payment processing platforms like Stripe, which I would imagine many of us probably use at the moment, I've at least heard of. But these tend to focus more on the one-off payments. You know, things like adding pay now buttons on invoices or just automating the payment runs. We've just said really how time consuming, you know, chasing payments are. And there's a service called Chaser, which automates chasing late payments. 
you know, all you do is you, you tell Chaser when the payment is due, you choose from a, a couple of different templates, you choose do you want it to go via email or text message, and then Chaser just goes off and does its thing. Chaser doesn't do, just do that as a, a process, it does have a lot more that encompasses it. Things like collection services for stubborn debts, and you've got outsourced credit control teams even as well. You know, charges are quite low. You know, good example would probably be Go Cardless. So I know the fees are 1% plus 20%, 20 pence. So really not a lot of fee for the time that's going to save. But you know, if fees do concern you, you know, think about picking up the phone, speaking to that late peer, so chasing that late peer, and thinking about that time where you could be using that towards your hourly rate instead. You know, it does pay for itself. And you know the stress I can build up, bring, speaking of those kind of um, late peers, so it does reduce the stress as well. And the last one I want to mention about receiving payments is a one called Cresco. So it's quite a newish one that's out on the market and it's really disputing, um, dis disrupting the entire industry. You know, it's removing fees by using technology from open banking. You know, it's definitely one to watch. And next slide, please, Kia. So I've mentioned quite a few different touch points and a few different apps that really fit into those touch points. But you know what, for everything else, there's apps like Zapier. You know, this one, it's a little bit more involved. It's definitely not just a, a one-click operation and it does it, but you get out what you put into it. And it lets you connect thousands more different apps and services that you might not find directly on your accounting app store. It's all about moving data in the cloud from one place to another. So automation between things like your Google Docs, you've got Gmail, honestly, load loads more when you start looking into it. You've got ready-made workflows, so things like Slack messages, adding the invoices, you know, creating electronic payments on invoices as well. You know, especially useful if you've got an accounting app that hasn't got a lot of apps. You know, if it has in Zapier, you know, it's got you sorted. And next slide, please, Kia. So I've talked a lot around a timeline, those touch points. I've talked about the different apps that can fit in, you know, some different options. But moving away from there, you know, looking a little bit more into you know, the profits per client. So what we've got on here is just a, a very simple view of where profits come from on a client by client basis. And at a very simple level, you know, costs they fall in between two different areas. So you've got the, the bit on the left, which is your your overheads. So basically just costs that simply exist for being a business. And then you've got the bit in the middle, which are your direct costs. So the the, the money that you spend servicing your clients. And then the bit on the right, you know, the profit that you're getting for that client. You know, thinking about increasing fees, you know, that, that might not be possible to then increase that profit. So what you've got to look at is looking at in decreasing those other costs, so the overheads and the direct costs. You know, the ones that we think we should really focus on would be the direct costs, you know, the ones per client. And if we move on to the next slide, just a bit of an example. So just one idea. So you can probably see going between the slides, um, the reduction in direct costs has made my profits increase. You know, if you can bring down the cost of service in each client, you know, whether it's a hundred pound a year, even fifty pound a year, you know, that's money back into your pocket. And bringing down so things like your fixed costs, you know, we all know it's going to be a large challenge, and it's probably something that you've already considered. Yeah, to reduce all things like overheads. You know, even examples of having a word with your landlord about rent. So how likely will they reduce the rent? You know, maybe even switch in energy tariffs as well. You know, they seem like they're the first areas that you target. But, you know, if direct costs are reduced, then the profits increase per client. Effectively, what you're doing is you're doing exactly the same for the client. So nothing's changing. They're paying exactly the same, and then everyone's happy. And 
Next slide, please, Kia. So if we get into that efficiency mindset, then what you realize that it, it, it is quite old fashioned to think accountants sell their time. You know, accountants sell services. And what your goal is to complete that service with the fewest resources while providing the most value. You know, in some areas, in some of you, you might charge um, based on hours worked. But if you think about reality, you know, does that really resemble reality, the hours that's, that's been spent? You know, even in that case, you're still doing a service. So you're still effectively charging for that service as well. And I think the bit that really stands out for myself, really from this window, is point number three. So better use of apps mean less staff time, you know, doing more with less. And I think in other words, you know, if you get better value from apps and you have an optimal app selection as well, then you automatically reduce those labor costs as well per client. And in the current recruitment crisis, you know, something you see on LinkedIn all the time, I hear a lot as well, speaking to accountants and bookkeepers, you know, this can be really invaluable. And of course, that word automation being key, you know, this is really where you'll save the most staff time as well. Next slide, please, Kia. So at this point, you know, what the question becomes is, you know, how do we know that we're getting that return on investment from apps? You know, often, you know, a lot of people, they buy into an app and then the costs just get thrown into an IT budget. You know, I know what I would advise, what we would advise is instead of this, you know, work out the cost per client for the app. And, you know, if you're a practice where you've got a handful of member of staff, I would I think it's probably quite likely that you're using things like timesheets. You know, that data is going to be right there. You know, how long are you spending on certain clients on certain tasks? You know, you could even you know, speak to your employees. You know, they're the ones that are doing that work. They'll be able to let you know, you know, what tasks are going well, what aren't going well, you know, what's taking the most time as well. And good apps, you know, they'll not just make your life easier, they'll increase capacity as well, because it'll save time. You know, sometimes it's extreme as feel like you've been given a new employee. And it is something I'm going to talk about a little bit later. So software as an employee, but it's kind of taken that into consideration as well. And finally, you know, an app might even inspire additional services. You know, good example would be Know, forecasting, it could be auditing apps as well. You know, that really helps you offer planning and insight to your clients and even you know, gets you away from doing that basic say, manual compliance work as well. Next slide, please, Kia. So you do really need to be careful. You know, don't just react to things like app price rises or increasing costs. You know, there can be a lot of hidden value in there as well. So even going back to the vendor, even thinking about, you know, what else is going to be offered? You know, something that is, I do really from an auto entry point of view firsthand is the software support and training side of things. So being able to see, you know, what the software can do, you know, how can I implement it? How can I adopt software? You know, that, that can be, again, invaluable. You know, not only knowing what the features an app can do, but being able to see what's going to come. So being able to grow with that app as well and develop. And partner programs, you know, a lot of vendors out there offer different partnership programs that's going to have added value, added benefits. You know, it could be things like you know, helping with marketing, could be onboarding, you know, offsetting costs even. And even thinking about your clients, you know, have a, a little discussion with them you know what do they want to use what's their preferences and again that word automation being key you know apps that can integrate you know interconnect transfer data from place to place you know that's going to save duplication and reduce errors as well next slide please Kia. so next consideration is you know who pays for the app that contributes to those direct costs per client that we've just been talking about. You know, with app price rises increasing across a year, you know, many accountants have been looking at ways to move client costs. 
you know, alternatively, if, you, if you're looking at increasing fees, then producing invoices for clients where it's been itemized out with your costing. So break down about your services, your labor, you know, that really gives a visual aspect to your clients where they can really see where those prices are going up. And I know, again, a good example from me from auto entry is with accountants and bookkeepers, you know, you can itemize out what's called auto entry credits by clients. So really being able to see a straightforward way to see these figures where you can then, again, show that visually to the clients if needed. Next up, next one, please. So, you know, sometimes, you know, apps, you know, they're just not right. You know, they cost too much and you need to really think about, is it time for me to change? And considerations wise, there's a, a few things really to bear in mind before you, you do make that leap and that change. And that first one that we see on this window, no, create a time window. You know, think about you know when this is going to happen, you know, how this is going to happen. You know, even thinking about that time as an investment as well. You know, data can normally be moved over and migrated from one place to another, so one software. You know, things like exporting and importing, you know, it could be um, help from the vendor, even moving over. And ask around, you know, speak to colleagues, speak to other professionals to see what they think. Not even getting input from clients as well. And something that's really vital is actually seeing a demonstration, you know, making a hundred percent sure, you know, that app is going to be that right solution. And I know it mentions it on here, you know, ask these difficult questions. And it's something I can't emphasize enough is those difficult questions are really going to get you down to that detail to make a hundred percent sure it's going to be that right solution. And timing. So, you know, is there a perfect time to move over? So is it year end? Is it a quarter end? Is it a month end? And think about transitioning slowly. You know, something I see all the time is things like keeping the older clients, the so ones that are using the older apps and the old apps, and then the new clients that are coming on board, being able to add the apps to their portfolio. So them adopting the new features, you adopting the new features as well, just as importantly and just making that implementation that more successful as well. And next slide, please, Kia. So we can also look at increasing efficiency in the apps that we're using and the different services. So I did mention before the software's employee. So this is a philosophy that came about from someone called Natasha Everett. And it's something that sounds you know, super, super simple but it's actually more profound when you start digging into the actual details. And what we see on this window on the right is just a, a, a free ebook that Natasha has released, and it's called The Bookkeeper Superhero. Now it's, it's sponsored by us at Auto Entry, and much of it is about how software empowers efficiencies. So what we're not saying is we're not saying software will replace an employee. You know, that, that's never, ever going to be that goal. And even thinking back through history with accounting, you know, technology has been introduced. And if anything, technology has helped accountants and it's made them work faster. And that's the whole point. You know, what she really means is you must treat apps you use almost like an employee. You know, things like um, what is going to work best with your schedule, you know, assigning tasks on a schedule basis or even use it on a scheduled basis for all similar tasks that are all lumped together rather than just using it on like an ad hoc basis. And, you know, get to know what it's capable of to make best use of it. You know, again, example from myself is, you know, features in, in auto entry, you've got something called statement reconciliation, you know, something that's unique and not offered by other competitors, but it's about reconciliation of end of month expenditure. Most people, would say auto entry might just be receipts and invoices, but just like with other apps, you know, if, if you just looked, there's loads of features in there that can save you hours. And even thinking back to Natasha's point about scheduling, so scheduling, say, statements to go in at the end of the day so that they're sitting there ready for the next morning, it's that kind of organization and approach that's really going to make you get best value from apps and at the end of the day, save that time. On, on costs of your staff. 
Next slide, please, Kia. So Natasha also highlights a concept of what's called brunching. So this can deliver efficiencies again within the apps that you use. And it's so fundamentally simple. You might even think when I mention it, no, why aren't I doing it now if you, if you aren't already starting to do it? So what the technique is partly inspired by is that realization that accountants effectively, you know, the data processors in the modern age, you know, much of the work that you do involve around moving data from A to B, so moving it around. And many of you work on a client by client basis right now. So picking up a task for a client, you know, use an app to service the needs, then move to the next client. And this is just like an, an efficient and ad hoc way to work. What Natasha is suggesting is consider the tasks, not the clients, and do a lot of the similar tasks all together. So especially if it's involving processing very similar types of data. One, it's going to be more efficient. And two, you're going to be less likely to forget those small details required within the process. You know, basically turning a lot of those smaller tasks into that one larger task that's going to be completed more efficiently. And next slide, please, Kia. So moving over to Kia this time. So a little bit of a show around ChatGPT and generative AI. So yeah, hand over to Kia. So what is the big new thing? And it's something called generative AI. Um, which means it's artificial intelligence that can make new things, which sounds amazing. I and mean, we've all seen uh, things on TV where with, or maybe on the internet where it's created fantastic artworks or it's written, you know, um, Harry Potter stories or, or things like this. But it's actually better to say that this new generative AI synthesizes from existing material. And how it does this is with the writing, at least with the ChatGPT side of things, it has these things called large language models, LLMs. And these, is, these are basically massive, massive databases of um, web content, um, novels, you name it. And th there's various LLMs and they're all linked together in various clever ways too. Um, and the end result is that um, these things can produce copy and they can talk back to us in a way that feels to us spookily human. But what's actually happening is it's, it's a kind of trick that these things aren't artificially intelligent, by the way. There's no intelligence involved here. This is just one step further in the same kind of machine learning technology that's been around for quite a while. It just so happens that this, these, kind, these breakthroughs, which are relatively small on a scale of... Um, machine learning breakthroughs full stop, but they happen to produce something which we humans find very impressive and, and very clever. Um, but this, this machine learning has been around for a long time, I think several decades since um, the actual principles uh, behind the breakthroughs this year were, in, were invented. Um, the best way of thinking about uh, ChatGPT when it generates copy and, and talks to us and looks like and talks like a human is that it's a little bit like predictive text on your phone and it's actually very similar to that. If you recall on your iPhone when you, you're tapping away at a text message, it will suggest the next word for you and you can tap that sometimes. People generally don't, but you could if you wanted to tap, tap that. And if there was a meme, wasn't there was a, a game about two or three years ago where you could just keep tapping the generative, the um, predictive text button on your phone and it would, it would create sentences, absurd, weird sentences, but they were grammatically correct and they would make sense. Well, chat GPT is essentially very similar to that. It's not very far beyond, really. I mean, obviously, technologically, it's a fantastic achievement, but really, in terms of how it works, all it's doing is predicting what comes next using its very, very large language model of the internet. And it's, so it's essentially, it's, if you ask a question, it answers the question by thinking what is most likely to be the answer based on, it, on its knowledge. Um, the two technologies out there um, at the moment being used most in terms of uh, generative AI for copy and writing are ChatGPT, which is by a company called OpenAI, um, but it's mostly known um, through Microsoft products, so they're rolling it out on Copilot, which is an extension of Microsoft Office products, but it's also in Bing search engine 
and the Edge web browser as well. It's built into both those two things. But Google also has Bard, which you access through its search engine. And which is better between ChatGPT and Bard? Well, it's a constant, it's basically a neck and neck race. Um, ChatGPT's probably got the, the, the lead at the moment. It's certainly got the headlines, I think, and um, people um, thinking and, and inquiring about it. And Google Bard's perhaps a little bit behind in terms of the hype, at least. Um, but for the demo today, we're going to be using a subscription to ChatGPT and OpenAI. This costs £20 a month. Um, but we're doing this so that we can see the up and coming features because generally speaking, the features that appear in the paid package will invariably roll down into the free package after a couple of months. So by the time you're, you're watching this, you may well find that the things I'm talking about today and the tools I'm using within ChatGPT are now freely available. In fact, I'm almost certain that will be the case. Uh, but for this demo, we're using this um, subscription. So it's £20 a month. And to be honest with you, £20 a month is not a huge amount of money if you're in a business. And I would certainly consider perhaps paying up for the subscription so you can get these new features and, and remain at that cutting edge because that's really where all the kind of um, the competitive advantage, I think, is going to be presented is, is by is staying at that cutting edge of the generative AI technology. OK, so let's start the demo. The first thing we have to do is select ChatGPT4 up here in the top left hand corner. ChatGPT4 is where the cutting edge features are going to be found, some of which we're going to use today. But uh, basically ChatGPT3.5 Chat GPT is one that you're going to find everywhere, but ChatGPT4 is the one which comes as part of this paid for subscription. So we click that and the first thing we're going to do is take a look at a bank statement, an Ulster bank statement. This is a genuine business bank statement, although of course we've anonymized all the details, we've changed, um, this is one we use uh, in product development here at Auto Entry, but I've changed all the details around, so there's nothing of the original stuff there, but it's, it's the same structure and the same kind of information that you would find, uh, supposedly for a Frank's sandwich bar based in the same building in which Auto Entry is based in Dublin. So we tell it to upload that, and then we say, analyze this document. Send that to ChatGPT. ChatGPT uploads the file, has a bit of a think about it. And one thing we're going to have a lot of in this demo, unfortunately, is me filling in time like this <laughs> because ChatGPT can be quite slow, even though this is a paid for service. And then it tells us the basic information about that it's discovered from the statement. Um, including what it is, how long it is. But we can do other things. We can say to it, when were wages paid and to whom? So now it's going to go back into this document and have a look at it. And it's going to analyze it. It's going to pull out the information we've just asked in plain language. We haven't got to do control F to find information. We haven't got to even open the document. We can ask it to whom and when wages were paid and it goes through. And in these quote marks, you can see it's quoting, it's telling us where it's found this information. And it's pulling out all the dates and names when wages were paid, which appears to be weekly in this instance. And then it tells us under what way they were entered. Kevin's wages, so we guess that somebody called Kevin handles the wages for this particular business. OK, let's try something else. Let's say Google the recent changes to national insurance and summarise them for me. So as I'm writing this, we're about two months, I think one month away from recent uh, the November 2023 um, mini budget announcement when a couple of national insurance changes were announced. And here it is. It's gone off. It's Googled it and it is now summarizing for me the changes that are coming about. And if you notice here, it's even picked up on the, the changes to class four and class two uh, NICs as well, which um, a lot of people in the media missed, I think, focusing on, on the other kind of changes. And it's a fairly good summary. It's, it's put it into a numbered list for us and it summarizes it um, fairly well. OK, so you're thinking, well, that's, that's fairly clever. That's fairly good. But I can get that by Googling, you know, I can Google and use my own intelligence. OK, how about this? 
turn this summary into a short email that I can send to clients, uh, including an attention grabbing subject line. Now, I know several people listening to this webinar right now um, might not have English as a first language. They might not be very confident perhaps in their written English. And this is kind of where ChatGPT becomes a superstar because it is writing a grammatically correct email with, as we requested, a nice punchy subject line and it's summarizing all the information. Now, you can imagine how this could be useful um, in practice, in your, in, the, in your work you do every day. Um, something changes, you can ask it, ask ChatGPT to summarize it and turn all this into an email. Of course, you haven't got to just simply copy and paste all this. You could take this and read through it and edit it yourself or take out things you don't want to go in there or change a few things around. But it's a good starting point. And like I said, for somebody whose English skills aren't so great, it's, it's just amazing. But that's not all. We can do something else. We can say, turn this into a short, funny social media post with emojis. Now, um, this is assuming you have a social account, you have social accounts, and you can say this. So it says, okay, and here it goes. So it, it turns, it's turning it into a pithy, clever, social media post that you can now just cut and paste, complete with emojis and put onto your X stroke Twitter account or Facebook or even LinkedIn, I guess, if you take out the emojis. Um, and you can kind of see how this, this summarizing ability, uh, the ability has to summarize and create a kind of new copy based on that can be incredibly useful for accountants. Uh, if you're wondering about copyright, well, there isn't any, um, you can use the copy however, however you want to, what's generated here. So you can just literally just copy uh, and then paste it into where you want it to go. Now, one interesting thing about um, ChatGPT is that it considers programming languages um, to be the same as the English language or indeed French or German. All it's seeing is words and the relationship between words. And because of this, it understands Excel formulas as well. So we can say to it, create an Excel formula to work out the compound depreciation of an asset in cell A1. The depreciation will be 5% each year and the formula should output values for 15 years. So, here we go. It's telling us how to create a formula and a spreadsheet that will do this for us. Now, again, you can say, well, I can Google this. I can, you know, or if you don't know it, you know it, of course. So, you know, I can Google this and I can go off and find out quite easily. But what you'd probably find is something which is similar to what you want, but not quite the same, not exactly what you want. But what we're getting here is not only exactly what we want, but we're being told exactly how to do it um, in instructions, step-by-step um, -step instructions. And that, I think, is... A, a quite amazing thing. Um, it can work the other way around too. So this one I'm going to have to copy and paste because I'm not going to type this one out. But we can say explain the meaning of this formula. So again we'll send it off to ChatGPT. You can take a look. And it's now telling us it's the other way around. It's used to calculate the multi-payment for a loan based on constant payments and the constant interest rate. It's telling us what each component within the formula actually means. Um, so you can see how this could be very, very useful um, for those new to Excel, perhaps, or even those experienced in Excel. You can run formulas through this and you can do some quite amazing things. OK, now this one, I think, has been mentioned a few times. Um, it's, a, it's probably the, the most mind blowing thing you can do with ChatGPT. You can say to it, create a three year business plan for, let's say, a UK hairdresser. And here we go. It goes off and creates a three-year business plan for a hairdresser. Now, again, we don't have to just simply copy and paste this. 
In fact, I would what you probably want to do here I, is perhaps a good way of working is to treat this as a template. So it's now running through the various components you would normally find within a business plan. And it's applying them to hairdressers specifically. It's telling us to, you know, look out for the services offered. And then it's working out a financial plan. And you can take you can take this and copy and paste it into your document and, set it and use it as a template. And you can edit and expand upon it um, however you want to. Um, and of course, this will work for any kind of business um, that you might have. I use hairdressing as simply one that, that sprang to mind. Um, but yeah, that's I think it's absolutely amazing. Now, ChatGPT version 4 can not only be used to ask questions and generate copy in that way, you can even create your own chatbots. Click on Explore here. And then we can create a GPT. Now, I'm sure you might be one step ahead of me here, but you can see how powerful this can be. This is giving us a glimpse into maybe one or two years from now where we may be able to make chat GPT bots for ourselves, use this file function here or some other way. There is an API, by the way, which means that you can connect it up to various online databases. But if we could create a chat GPT bot that connects to accounting data within our accounting software, um, then we can create something that will be a first line for clients to access and approach on a daily basis and that will give them coherent answers about their very own finances. But what I'm going to do this time, I'm going to create a search bot, which a GPT chat bot, which goes off and finds answers from the HMRC website. And my exact phrase I'm going to use here is you will search the Gov UK website to find the answers to questions. Do not use other websites or other sources of information. The answers will summarise the information in a very strong, in a very, very straightforward way for people who are not financially literate. So we're making a new chatbot, a new specific chatbot here that we could feasibly deploy within your business on your website. We click go. It takes a while. This is a longer process because this is obviously a, a little bit more complicated, but it's building this GPT for us, this, this, this new chatbot that said, which we can deploy, deploy anywhere. And in fact, one thing that they've been muting actually at OpenAI is that we can, people can even sell these chatbots. So you can generate them like you would generate a program and then you could sell it um, or you could sell access to it. You know, people have to pay like a pound to access it. I don't know how it would work. So now we've got our new chatbot. We can think of kind of questions that people might ask perhaps who, who don't know much about this kind of thing. So one question could be, what do company directors need to know about how they are taxed? Let's ask you that one. Now, it says doing research with Bing here, and my best thought is that it's finding ways to phrase the search query. It is only searching Gov UK, but I think it uses Bing to kind of find ways to to phrase the search in, in the first place. So it knows it's, you know, it's just like when you go to Google, part of the skill is is, is knowing how to phrase your search so you get the best results. I think it uses Bing to kind of hone its results. So you can see what it's doing here. It's searching Gov UK um, for the various answers here. I specified Gov UK, by the way, because as far as I know, there isn't really an HMRC dedicated website. It's all, all part and parcel of Gov UK. Um, so we have to open it up to the entire Gov UK website, which makes isn't it's not no trouble doing that. It's not, not a difficult thing, not a bad thing to do because as we probably know, if you have to do a search on GovUK, you'll find that the information does tend to be scrambled across the entire site, really. Uh, and it can be everywhere. It can be under various headings, HMRC's own headings, or it could be under various other headings. Anyway, it's having a good search. It's, it's looking through the GovUK website and preparing an answer for us, all being well. Give it a few minutes. Sometimes it can get stuck, I've got to say this. And one thing you, you may have noticed that um, I've been cutting between various searches. Oh, here it is. And it gives us the answer. Um, all of this based on the official information at Gov UK, not websites that you might stumble across on the internet, which could be inaccurate. Um, not, um, you know, what some blog that some guy's written that he reckons is the truth. This is, this is all coming from Gov UK and it's all being summarized and rewritten by ChatGPT, and it's telling us what the tax tax implications are. 
Um, let's try another one. Um, what's the VAT rate on flapjacks? Very famous um, case, of course, of trying to work out what, when you're trying to find VAT rates on food. Um, and again, it does the same thing. I think it goes off to Bing to try and find a way of phrasing this search, and then it'll search the VAT, the Gov UK website to try and find an answer for us. As I was saying a moment ago, um, you may notice I've been cutting between um, various search queries because I have found that um, ChatGPT can be a little bit unreliable. Sometimes it, it just refuses to do things, it locks up. It's still new technology. Anyway, here we are, we've got the answer. Zero rated, which I think we all knew, although certain kinds of flapjacks, depending on where they're eaten and what they're made of, what they're made of, and as I'm sure we all know, flapjacks are a contentious issue in a world of that. But we have the answer that's right there. Let me share my screen. Guys, I um, just want to say at this point, thank you um, so far, Will, for great advice and the outline of an app. Back. I'm looking forward now to seeing how auto entry but, uh, uh, works. And Kia, um, really fab demo, Chat GPT. It's amazing, isn't it? It's frightening. It's all those things in one. Yeah. And I hope, I'm sure that our viewers watching today will have found that fascinating in terms of um, a quick overview and will want to hear more from you guys. Um, so, Claire, we do have a quick poll um, that we could show just before we do an auto entry demo if that's possible and if you'd like to find more uh, about um, get more information about what we've talked about today then tick the box 543 um, and we will get uh, your details um, off to auto entry so Will or Kia can talk to you or one of their team about how they can help you with the, the app stack and, and getting information in quickly okay so Will we are now going go live again after Kia's live demo at GPT and you're going to do a demo of auto entry. Tell us about it. I am. Yes, I'm just waiting. Can you see my screen? Just double checking. Oh, no. We're just taking the poll down now. Is it? Yeah. So, yeah, so what, what I'm going to cover, so a bit about just really what auto entry is. Very quick, like three, four minutes, probably just showing you around and really showing you the, really what, an automated data tool is going to like with look like with auto entry about time savings and service and clients. Um, again, just checking if my screen appeared or, or not. Yeah, yeah, you're fine. Oh, We've got live demo on it. Perfect. So if I load up the right window, there we go. You should see auto entry. So um, I know I've mentioned auto entry quite a bit today, obviously being the area that I work, but um, just to point out a few key areas today. So the window that I'm showing you at the moment, so this is just a list of my, my clients that I've got, and you'll probably notice straight away, so I've got a few that I integrated. I've even got an Excel client because I don't want them integrated, but it's that open ecosystem that I mentioned a bit earlier. So it doesn't just connect with, probably see Sage on mine, but obviously your zeros and your QuickBooks and all that sort of stuff as well. And my list of clients that I've got, I can just add as many clients as I want in. So I, I'm not limited to say, I've got to have 10 clients, I can't go over that. All I'm doing is I'm effectively using credits and I can use those credits in any of the companies that I like. You've also got the options to upload. So if I click my little upload button in the top right, if I choose one of my companies that I want to upload to, I can then upload into different pots or different areas and it's kind of like the usual thing from an automated data entry app where you've got a browser like this, you've got a mobile app I could use, and I've got email addresses I can send stuff to. And even being able to split stuff out by itemized lines, so I can do what's called capture item lines, which will itemize all the details out. And I can also upload a PDF with 100 invoices on, it'll automatically separate everything out as well. If I was to quickly go into one of my companies by clicking on the name, so very easy to use. So it is just a number of different inboxes for different things. So you've got the first one being purchase invoices or receipts that I can upload. I've then got my supplier statements. So you've heard me mention supplier statements a few times today already, but it's been able to upload a supplier statement and then it can automatically reconcile 
what I've already put in to know what's missing. So again, that big time saver. Very similar from a sales point of view, where I can get those say, sales invoices in if you've got clients doing them on, on Excel. And I've got bank statements where things can be extracted from a bank statements area in a lot of different formats, whether it's for you know, zeros, your QuickBooks and stuff like that. And I do have an expense area where whether it, it might be something I'm doing with my colleagues because they're out on the road, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, where mileage and um, non-reimbursable expenses need to be entered. Or for clients, they might just need a better system to record their expenses. And in each of these different areas, you've just got a, an inbox. If I was to go into one of my inboxes, this will just show me a list of everything that's been uploaded. And really high level, it is just showing accounts, categories, and VAT codes, all being memorized. So I haven't been in to select these. I've uploaded it and it's read the information as a, that automatically being flagged. And even within each of these items, I can go view, which will then bring up my image of my uploaded document on the left, along with all the information that's been extracted from this invoice. And if I do change something, like if I change that to 5,000 as a slightly different category, it's me being able to memorize it for future reference. And I mentioned before about it being itemized. So there's one of my lines that I've only got one line on this invoice, but it would automatically split it out again with that similar concept of being able to remember different categories and different codes. And last little bit I just want to jump into, I know we're a bit short for time as well, is really just to show you the supplier statements, because I've mentioned that a few times, but really just give you a bit of a visual. If I go into that inbox and I go to view in one of my unreconciled statements that I've already done, it'll just show you what's been extracted as well as the image that I've uploaded. And then in that reconciliation tab, in two seconds, I can see straight away I'm missing that very bottom transaction because I can see that at the bottom. I need to either find it or I can create it from this window. So imagine something that has I don't know, 20 sheets of paper. I'll be able to pinpoint that in, in seconds as well. But yeah, just like I say, just a really quick little overview um, of what auto entry is, a little bit around a visual and what it looks like feature wise. Um, but yeah, certainly if you want to know more, um, pop that into the, the poll as well if you haven't done already. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah, I really enjoy I mean, just very briefly, that's um, going to save a huge amount of effort and time and also find errors quickly, I, I presume. What's the main, what am I, you know, when you've got all this stuff in there and you can bring it in for clients, presumably are uh, obviously on online zero QuickBooks Sage, what about the paper bag jobs? Because they still exist. Yep. You've only got so to my wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can still do all that within in the app as well. It's it's all about that extraction. So um this the official stat is it's ninety nine percent accurate in what it does as well. So yes, it's that time saver, but it's the accuracy part of it as well that's gonna be the, the time saver. Yeah. I think that's so amazing. Listen, guys, I've really enjoyed spending time with you today. It's one of the most interesting webinars I've been on this year, um, primarily because we went through the app stack, which always confuses me and what's changing and what's new and what you keep your eyes open for. So fantastic, Will, for that. And Keir, um, you frighten the living daylights out of me on ChatGPT. Um, I don't fancy talking yeah. to a boss, but it's going to happen, isn't it? You can imagine. You go on the website. Yeah, it's interesting, and the isn't it? Uh, load your books and records or extract them from your online into whatever, you know, and it's going to happen, isn't it? Final words of wisdom, Keir. Um, I will check out GPT in Bing or in the Edge browser. Have a, have a play with it. You've nothing to lose. 30 minutes of your time. Try a few of the prompts I mentioned um, in the, you know, try a business plan prompt, for example. That's, that's probably the really key one, the really useful one. That lots of people are using at the moment. Just play around with it, see what you can get. Remember that it sometimes lies, and that's the key thing. It's trying to please you, it's trying to give you the answer you want, and it can what's called hallucinate. Just be careful, but play around with it, have fun. Okay, and you uh, would recommend the £20 a month version four, was it? Yeah, that gives you the latest version of it, but as you can see, it is, it is, it's not great. I mean, you're paying £20 a month for a service which can sometimes not work, 
but you do get the latest features that we rolled out in, you know, in the coming year. So, yeah, I would 20 quid. What's 20 quid a month? Nothing. Give it a go. And, and Will, your final words of wisdom for our audience? Um, just try ChatGPT. So I, I use it myself for emails and stuff like that. It's, it's not as scary as you think, is my final words. Brilliant. Well, thanks everybody for joining us today. Thank you, Will and Keir, for that outstanding presentation. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Claire, back at the office for your production of today's uh, webinar. We hope to see you all soon on another one. And please remember to um, contact us or the guys here if you want further information. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Thank you, Goodbye. everyone. Thanks, Ian.